Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the Lit Poetry Podcast and to today's poem. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. We'll begin by listening to the poem before returning to start our discussion with some biographical information about the poet. This poem is read to you by Simon Jackson. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air, only from the long line of spray, where the sea meets the moon-blanched land. Listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles, which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Begin and cease, and then again begin, with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery we find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy nor love nor light, nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Dover Beach was first published in 1867, although it is commonly believed to have been composed during Matthew Arnold's honeymoon in 1851. The poem holds a remarkable position within the Victorian body of literature and is often regarded as one of the finest poems of its time. This distinction arises partly from its stark divergence from the prevailing poetry of that time. Renowned poets such as Alfred Lord Tennyson, England's Poet Laureate, and Robert Browning adhered to rigid formalities in their works. Indeed, much of Arnold's other poems share this similar trait. However, Dover Beach stands out by refusing to conform to the predictable structures or patterns usually associated with poetry of that time. In this regard, the poem serves as a precursor to the literary movement that emerged in the 20th century of modernism, embodying the innovative spirit of this new movement and through its complex psychology, reflecting the existential uncertainty of existentialism. While Dover Beach does not explicitly mention its historical context, except for a vague allusion to a previous era of abundant faith, most scholars concur that comprehending the poem requires an understanding of the specific intellectual, spiritual and social climate in which it was composed. The poem conveys a sense of fear and unease concerning the erosion of faith, and the historical backdrop illuminates the origins of these sentiments. 
The 19th century in England witnessed significant transformations in how humanity perceived its place in the world. For instance, Charles Lyell's groundbreaking contributions to the field of geology introduced substantial doubts regarding the traditional biblical timeline of the Earth's creation. This sudden uncertainty was magnified by the discoveries made by Mary Anning, commonly referred to as the Fossil Lady, who unearthed peculiar skeletons in the coastal regions of southern England, reminiscent of the poem's geographical setting overlooking the English Channel, further fueling doubt and scepticism. Advancements in evolutionary biology further unsettled the notion of humankind as the central figure in a universe fashioned by a divine creator. In essence, Arnold composed the poem during a period of widespread readjustment and anxiety, reflecting the prevailing sentiments of the time. The poem articulates this mindset, culminating in an apprehensive tone that contemplates an uncertain future. So the first theme to talk about today in regards to this poem deals with the loss of faith and certainty. During the Victorian period, Matthew Arnold wrote this poem, and the poem itself mourns the decline of religious faith resulting from advancements in several disciplines during that era. These disciplines include evolutionary biology, geology, archaeology, and biblical textual and analysis, among others. The poem perceives the onset of a significant historical shift, which it symbolises through the liminal space of the beach, a hazy boundary between land and sea. Consequently, the poem prompts readers to contemplate the losses incurred as humanity gradually distances itself from the uncertain yet steadfast convictions of Christian faith. The speaker in Dover Beach associates the loss of faith with a loss of certainty. The beach itself serves as a representation of this loss, both visually and audibly. Initially, the poem provides no direct indication that its central theme revolves around the loss of faith. Instead, it commences by depicting the ambience surrounding the speaker. The descriptions of the sea and the sound of pebbles on the beach possess an initial lyrical beauty, yet they conceal the eternal note of sadness that is unveiled at the end of the first stanza. This abrupt intrusion of sadness alludes to the speaker's profound sense of loss, which is further explored as the poem unfolds. Through the symbol of the sea, the poem conveys two significant notions. First, it suggests that significant shifts in societal fabric transpire gradually. The slow and repetitive movements of the beach symbolise the incremental yet inevitable loss of faith that the speaker perceives within this historical moment. Furthermore, by relating the loss of a religious faith to the ebb and flow of waves, the poem suggests that these transformative historical shifts occur in cyclical patterns. In essence, they resemble the continuous motions of waves. The speaker even envisions the ancient Greek playwright Sophocles, perceiving the same sense of sadness in the sea that the speaker experiences in the present. This analogy draws a parallel between the waning significance of the classical Greek gods during the speaker's time and the impending irrelevance of the Christian god in the near future. It does not necessarily imply a revival of religious faith, but rather suggests that something else will emerge to fill the void left by its absence, such as the ascendancy of scientific dominance. The speaker's position on this loss of religious faith becomes clear in the third stanza. Faith once made the world full and bright, the poem says. That is, it offered comfort and joy in its certainty. Its loss then represents melancholy. What's more, the sea of faith once touched the shores of the entire world, but now is withdrawing. The poem is essentially saying that this loss of faith is global, in turn suggesting the vast reach of scientific advancements at the time. The speaker doubles down on the idea that scientific advancement represents a loss rather than a gain in the poem's final couplet. 
saying that the new era will herald confused alarms of struggle and fight, and ignorant armies clashing by night. In other words, the speaker believes that scientific advancement will bring only scientific, not spiritual certainty, and will lead to more doubt and questioning, which is, in fact, an important part of the scientific method of inquiry. Overall, then, the poem expresses a kind of resignation. The speaker fully admits the change that is in the process. It is as inevitable as the waves rising and falling, and challenges the reader to consider whether this loss of faith is progress or a wrong turn. Dover Beach, then, is a deeply pessimistic poem that questions the dominant values of its day and embodies the sense of grief that some have felt at the prospect of the loss of religion. This questioning still stands up in the 21st century, calling on its readers to examine whether their own lives are spiritually fulfilled. Welcome back. The next theme to discuss deals with notions of nature and alienation. Tied to the notion of the loss of faith is a shift in humanity's connection to the natural world. Dover Beach, written in the wake of the Romantic era when poets celebrated nature as a remedy to excessive rationality, raises questions about humankind's relationship with nature. Instead of finding joy or the transcendent in the natural environment, the speaker experiences a profound sense of sorrow, even while acknowledging the beauty of the beach. The cold indifference and immense power of the natural world make the speaker feel small and insignificant. As such, the poem endeavours to capture the intricacy of human experience as just one facet of the natural world, rather than its centre. At the core of the poem lies an implicit acknowledgement that humanity is merely a constituent within a larger system, the natural world. The natural scenery provokes the speaker to contemplate timescales that diminish the significance of their own life. The speaker gazes upon a scene that is, on one hand, visually stunning, but on the other hand, a stark reminder of nature's lack of concern for humankind. The beach and sea assume the most prominent roles in the poem. Formed through millions of years of erosion and the ceaseless movement of water, they embody temporal scales far surpassing the span of human existence, perhaps even surpassing the capacity of the human mind to comprehend them. The speaker's encounter with the vastness of time creates a sense of detachment from the natural scene being observed. This scene evokes a feeling of insignificance, as if nature is almost hostile towards the struggles of humanity. This sentiment is exemplified by the harsh and melancholic sounds of the beach, which resounds with an eternal note of sadness as the pebbles shift with the rhythm of the waves. The mention of eternity, specifically, connects the concept of time to the speaker's sense of alienation. Without the assurance of an eternal afterlife provided by God, the vast timescales evoked by nature appear almost mocking underscoring humanity's limited position in the world. The speaker's contemplation of the ancient Greek playwright Sophocles further accentuates the perceived tragedy unfolding. The speaker imagines that Sophocles, renowned for his tragic works, would have sensed the same loneliness and sorrow in the sea as the speaker experiences within the poem. According to this, the speaker believes that human existence is inherently sorrowful. On one hand, the poem asserts that nature has always possessed this alienating effect. However, on the other hand, it also implies that the speaker is particularly attuned to the present moment, the moment in which the poem was composed. The consistent use of the present tense throughout the poem signifies the speaker's perception that the current period is a particularly isolating and estranging time. The natural setting of the poem then makes the speaker question everything about human existence, a state that was once made certain by religious faith. There is a paradoxical nature about the beach. It is always shifting its shape, yet it can stay roughly as it is 
for millions of years, seemingly always in transition and always the same. This paradox embodies the way in which people try to make sense of their lives while the world itself offers no certainty. In this way, the poem is a precursor of 20th century existentialism and is often considered ahead of its time. Ultimately, Dover Beach exposes the underlying melancholy of awe-inspiring natural sights. While the speaker does admit to the scene's beauty, that beauty doesn't compensate for the way in which the scene makes the speaker feel small and insignificant. So that's it for the second last episode of this season. Time to say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this week's poem by Matthew Arnold. Next week, we'll be featuring our final poem for the season, The Pulley, by George Herbert. To support our work, please subscribe to the podcast or to our YouTube channel. You can also visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. A music video for this week's poem is now live on YouTube. We'll finish by listening one final time to the poem. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next week. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air, only from the long line of spray, where the sea meets the moon-blanched land. Listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles, which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Begin and cease, and then again begin, with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy nor love nor light, nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.